Hi, so I'm going to talk about uh, using the using ENCODE data for cancer uh, genomics. So first of all, I'd just like to point out that lots of the ENCODE data is relevant to cancer. Uh, many of the ENCODE cell lines, as you probably know, are, associate, are cancerous cell lines, for instance, Hep G2, A549, MCF7, and so forth. And these often can be easily paired with a normal, and they give you a sense of the uh, oncogenic transformation. Furthermore, a number of these cell lines, uh, K562, um, uh, Hep G2, and so forth, are extremely data rich and have a tremendous uh, number of assays on them and are, are really um, unprecedented in that way for um, studying oncogenesis. So I'm going to talk about using this data in four ways to look at cancer genomics. First, I'm going to talk about background mutation rate correction. Then I'm going to talk about studying network wiring, variant prioritization, and then looking at drivers of differential expression. So first of all, background mutation rate estimation. Uh, one of the main ways we find drivers in cancer is through looking at mutational recurrence within a cohort. Um, one of the problems, though, is that often this mutational recurrence can be confounded by genomic covariates such as replication timings. We have a lot more uh, mutations in late replicating regions than early replicating regions. So if you look at recurrence, we'll, we might be fooled and think, for instance, this region is uh, a driver region because it has a lot of mutations when it just simply has lots of mutations because it's late replicating. So we have to take this into account. Now, the, and the, um, there's the, the mutation rate is correlated with many different uh, types of genomic signals in addition to replication timing. For instance, it's also uh, um, correlated with open uh, chromatin. And ENCODE has, of course, a wealth of this genomic signal data. So we've shown how you can put a lot of this data together uh, into a model to estimate the background mutation rate. Uh, basically, we do principal components of all the uh, different types of ENCODE signal data, and then we use uh, these principal components to estimate the background mutation rate. And one of the main things we see is that we need lots of PCs, often 10, 20 PCs, to accurately estimate background mutation rate. And then, of course, we can look at the, the signals that really are driving these PCs. There are things, of course, like replication timing, but a lot of the histone mark data really also is very important for this estimation. So now what do we do with an accurate estimation of background mutation rate? Well, we can use that in a, a model to look at um, our recurrent mutations um, and to find drivers. Now, a simple model that doesn't do that would be, for instance, a binomial model, which assumes a constant rate of mutation across the genome. Uh, we're going to contrast things to this. We have two different models, a, a beta binomial model and a negative binomial model that allow the uh, mutation rate to vary across the genomic bins. And this uh, mutation rate to vary with uh, genomic covariates, such as replication timing, history marker data, and so forth. So what do we get when we look at this? Well, here's, for instance, the empirical distribution of mutations in genomic bins. Here's the simple binomial model. It obviously doesn't fit very well. And here's our correction model. You can see it fits uh, a bit better. And this is for the beta binomial. You can do the same thing for the negative binomial. And then when you come to actually finding recurrently mutated regions of the genome, having this better model deflates uh, your p-values. So you don't get these inflated uh, p-values. For instance, if you simply have a simple binomial model, you'll call lots of regions of the genome as recurrently mutated. Whereas uh, if you have our um, beta binomial model that takes into account the uh, genomic covariates, you'll be much more um, stingy with uh, finding recurrently mutated regions. You can see this, of course, in, in other types of graphical formats. Okay, so let's go on to the next topic, which is uh, genomic uh, rewiring in cancer. Um, so let me uh, sort of tell you about this. I'm going to focus on one particular transformation that from um, uh, K562 to GM12878. Uh, GM12878 represents a normal blood cell. K562 represents a white blood cell tumor. Um, and so we now, for these cell lines, where we have tremendous amounts of ENCODE TF chip data, uh, we can actually look at the changes in the regulation and how the, the regulatory network rewires. So for instance, if we look at the tumor, we have some connections there. If we look at the normal, we'll have different connections. The, if we compare them, we'll see some of the connections are lost, some are gained, and some are retained. Now, here's a kind of global picture of that. It's a very complicated hair, but when you look at this, of course, across all the different targets, this just shows the 109 regulators, not all their targets, which is too complicated of a picture. But even here, you can see uh, the things that are rewire a lot and all the changed uh, connections.
is a useful picture to look at. Uh, however, often these pictures are, are complicated, and particularly if you have all the targets, it'll be very complicated. So we try to develop ways of simplifying these pictures. And one way we have of doing this is not looking at the change of regulation to all the targets, but grouping our targets into pathways or modules or gene communities, and then looking at the change uh, in regulation of these communities. Okay, And the idea is there's far fewer communities than there are targets. Uh, now, there's a nice mathematical trick for doing this. Uh, it's called latent Dirichlet allocation, which is a method often used in text processing, where you can get look at the um, underlying topics in documents. Uh, here, we think of the documents as like transcription factors or the topics of these modules. Uh, so we repurpose this uh, calculational methods. And here's kind of what we, we find when we look at things. The, let's just focus on this. Uh, GM12878 to K562 transition first. We have all the different transcription factors here. And for instance, we can look at, for instance, let's take a look at MIC. We can look at the edges that are gained in, uh, in cancer. This is a model for CML, chronic myelitis leukemia. Or we can see lots are gained, very few are lost. And conversely, NBN is a factor where it loses a lot of things. We can just sort all the factors by how much they gain or lose edges, but perhaps more useful is we can also sort them in terms of these gene communities. And this is a kind of useful thing to understand which of the, the, the factors are really associated with the change in oncogenesis. Okay, let's go on to the next topic. Just giving you a quick run through. We're gonna look at variant prioritization. Now variant prioritization obviously is a big topic for ENCODE in general. People are always using the ENCODE data to prioritize variants. I'm gonna focus here on just one particular type of data that's new in ENCODE. This is the RNA binding proteins. Before uh, the last ENCODE, there were not very much of this data. Now there's quite a bit uh, from the ECLIP experiments. Two things that are useful to know about this. First of all, the ECLIP experiments cover a large fraction of genomic real estate, actually more than CDS. Uh, but these experiments are actually very precise. The binding sites in them are much more precise, actually, than uh, TF uh, binding sites. So lots of uh, annotated data. And so we tried to build some simple uh, pipeline we call radar for um, putting all this data together to annotate variants. We obviously put all the data together. We put it together with conservation data, both across organism and within the human population. Since we're looking at RNAs, we have to include secondary structure. We use all these to make a score. We have this entropy weighting scheme for putting all these things together to make a score. And then we also combine with a kind of tissue specific score that's related to the cell line that um, you're looking at, the tissue context that you're looking at. Just a little bit more on these features. You can see that each of the binding protein sites is conserved really to a different degree, which really uh, highlights the fact of why you want to use uh, conservation. And also a lot of the uh, binding proteins, as I'll show you in a bit, they actually come together to make a network and there's a lot of co-binding in these proteins. And so we obviously want a more highly weight network hubs in the, in the RNA binding protein network than not. And we take that into account in our procedure. And briefly, we find that uh, our procedure gives higher scores uh, to, to cosmic genes, known uh, cancer genes than not, uh, for, and also it tends to give uh, higher scores to recurrently mutated regions, for instance, in breast cancer than not, which gives us some confidence that the score is useful in a cancer context. And now to the last uh, topic, which is finding uh, regulatory drivers of differential expression. So I've told you a second, a second ago in oncogenesis how you might have the actual regulatory connections between the TF and the target change, you know, rewiring. But you could also have a situation where the targets remain the same, but the uh, gene expression of the target genes changes a lot, okay? And here, what we want to do is find the TFs that are associated with the um, target genes that change most in cancer. So we use the TCGA data, which shows how genes change in cancer, and we use the ENCODE regulatory network to associate regulators with targets. Then we build a simple uh, regression model that tries to explain the target, uh, the change in gene expression from all the uh, regulators. We can find the regulators that are most highly weighted in this expression model. And that's what we plot um, here. So we have all the different uh, regulators, we have all the different cancers, and this just shows these uh, regression coefficients, which ones get most highly weighted. And you can see that some factors really are associated with upregulation in cancer. MIC is very famous for being associated with that. And so then some have, are more differential. We can also do the same for RNA binding proteins and their network. And here we find that sub one is the RNA binding protein that's most 
associated with upregulation in cancer. And it turns out you can also look at uh, survival curves, a well-known one for MIC. For instance, we have more active MIC. You tend to have differential survival. But you can see the same thing for a sub-1 for the RNA binding proteins. And also in how to put the um, RNA binding proteins and the TFs together, we can build up a regulatory hierarchy just like we showed from TFs. And here we find that the things at the top of the hierarchy, both the RNA and also the uh, TFs tend to uh, drive uh, gene expression the most. So here's the TFs and here's the RNA and here's the average correlation with uh, change in gene expression. There's a lot of there's a lot of crosstalk between the TF and RNA networks. And just to sort of highlight here, here's MIC and sub one, and we just point out that these these can really act together uh, on the same uh, genes, in fact, promoting uh, transcription and also post-transcription regulation. Okay, so with that, I'm going to conclude on my four topics, and let me just go through them now in more detail. So what have I told you? I've told you how the ENCODE data is useful for cancer genomics. First way, it's useful for developing accurate models for background mutation rate. We've developed these uh, parametric models for doing this. One of the key things is we have to use lots of data, often 10, 20 different uh, principal components to get to accurately model uh, background mutation rate. Next thing I've told you about is how um, lots of the encode cell lines are obviously associated with cancer, and we can pair them with normals, and we can look at the rewiring of the TF regulatory network in some of these cell lines with lots of data, uh, particularly um, th those associated with CML. Here we see lots of uh, complex rewiring. It's very interesting, and we've developed this procedure associated with uh, latent Dirichlet allocation to simplify this to look at the changes in modules or changes in gene communities. And the third thing we talked about is using the ENCODE data for variant prioritization. We have a pipeline called RADAR, which uses the RNA binding protein data along with secondary structure conservation and so forth and prioritizes uh, variants. Um, and then finally, I talked about using the ENCODE data to find the, regulator, the regulators, RNA binding proteins or TFs, that are associated with driving differential expression by using a simple um, a regression model, and then putting these regulators into a hierarchy and seeing that the ones that drive the differential expression tend to be at the top, and there's also a bit of crosstalk uh, between the RNA and the TS. Okay, with that, I think I'll conclude. I thank you for your attention. I want to acknowledge uh, the people that worked on this. I think the principal science that really, the principal scientist that led most of this work was Ching Zhang, who's an associate research scientist with me for a number of years. She's now moved on to a faculty position in Irvine. She worked very closely with two graduate students in the lab, Jason Liu and Dong Hun Lee. I show all the different uh, tools they developed with the uh, URLs here. And also I'll say we have lots of openings for people who want to do ENCODE related research in the lab. And you can just go to our jobs page if you're interested. Thank you very much for your attention.